thank you for being with us today. I'm happy to see all of you for the second colloquium, which is part of the EPFL Center for Intelligence Systems colloquium series. Last time we had the pleasure to host Professor Goldwasser. Today we are delighted to have Professor Ver with us, who is going to talk about different approaches to design differentiable sorting and ranking operators. Just to give you an idea of what to expect today, so we will have one hour together is Professor Wert speaking for 45, 50 minutes, then we have time for Q&A, which will be moderated by Professor Flammarion, who is Professor at the Siri and of Machine Learning Laboratory here at EPFL. He's also a member of the CIS Steering Committee. So please, if you have any questions for Professor Wert, feel free to submit them through the Q&A feature on Zoom. We'll also collect them and discuss them then in the Q&A session. Uh, before diving into the presentation, I would like to thank Professor Ver, of course, Professor Jim Larris, Professor Flammarion, and the CS team for organizing this event. I will now give the floor to Professor Jim Larris, the Dean of the EPFL School of Computer and Communication Sciences and member of the, and, and member of the Board of Directors of CS. Thank you, Jan. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Professor Ver um, for agreeing to do this seminar, <laughs> even though I didn't get a trip to Lausanne out of it. <laughs> It's a, it's a pleasure to have him here. Um, uh, Professor uh, Ver, just to give you a quick summary, is a research scientist at Google Brain in Paris and is uh, a researcher at, uh, I guess they call it the mean, uh, Paris Tech. Um, he graduated uh, from the Cold Polytechnique and uh, Cours de Mine and holds a PhD in mathematics from Paris CIS. Um, and he served, uh, he did a postdoc at Kyoto University in computational biology and then joined Ecole de Mines uh, de Paris um, as a researcher and uh, worked there for many years and um, became a professor in, of mathematics at Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. And then uh, I guess shortly after that moved to Google Brain and so he's going to be giving his talk today on uh, the topic of differentiable ranking and sorting. So, Professor Baer. Uh, thank you very much. It's, so it's a great pleasure to be here. And again, sorry for the technical uh, issues, but we, you know, we learn how to work uh, remotely nowadays. So, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I really miss, uh, uh, I would have loved to come to Lausanne, but hopefully uh, one day I'll be able to visit the campus there. Uh, and so today I will, I will focus on a kind of specific topic with some technicalities, but uh, I try to give you some you know, broader, uh, broader view of what I think is an important direction in modern machine learning and more generally differentiable programming. So I'll take the example of what we call differentiable ranking and sorting explaining to you why I think it's important, but trying also to, you know, to present the, the, the longer uh, view of that. So here is the, the rough agenda for today, if I have time. Uh, I'll start by you know, explaining a bit motivation for that work, and there will be two main technical parts. One I call embed, and the second differentiate. Uh, try, I'll try to explain to you more what I mean by that. And then I'll, I'll keep some time to discuss some uh, variety of extensions, either you know, towards applications or towards more methods uh, before concluding. Uh, so let's start with the motivation. Uh, you know, it's not a surprise for everybody here probably that in the last few years we've seen tremendous uh, progress in machine learning, um, in AI, sometimes we call it uh, this way. Uh, and at the root of it, it's, it's fair to say that we have, uh, one, one big progress has been that now we can handle large amounts of data through big computational systems. Uh, and one of the big success of this, of this trend has been to develop tools to automatically tune parameters of complex systems. So this picture, for example, represents uh, you know, it's a toy picture for a very standard neural network called that deep learning, can be convolutional or not. But basically, you can think of it as uh, a system composed of basic components. Um, in this case, that would be neurons or convolutional layers, these kind of things. Uh, the basic components typically have parameters, which are, uh, which are free, which can be optimized. And training the system more or less amounts to finding a way to optimize the parameters. And for that, there is a wonderful tool called you know, gradient descent, basically, when you have a function to optimize, you define some optimization function, and through gradient descent or variant of it, 
it's possible to tune the parameters so that you optimize some objective function. So uh, standard machine learning uh, classification or regression is really a direct application of that principle where we target as objective function the fact that the system outputs the correct label for some input data like image. Uh, and, by, and by optimizing the weights, it's possible to train a model that at the end of the day manages more or less to predict the correct label on your images. Now on the technical side, uh, side I will insist on the fact that this, uh, these models nowadays can handle large amounts of data because uh, they have been developed in such a way that it's possible to compute, you know, to have some forward-backward forward, type of operation where in the forward pass it's possible given some input at some, of some component to output some operation. And the backward layer allows to compute the gradient. Like if you want to change the output by something in one direction, how should you change the input of any component of this big system? And the magic of uh, differentiation of, uh, of, uh, of functions allows you to back propagate the gradient so that if you have something you want to optimize at the end, you know how to move what's in the input or any layer there. So it works well for machine learning, uh, but more generally, uh, nowadays we have hardware and software that allow to create complex systems that perform a sequences of operations, can be parameterized by uh, continuous parameters, and can be trained as long as we are able for each local model to compute a forward and backward pass, meaning to compute a function and its gradient, basically. So of course, this works very well when, when the data as input and intermediate layers are vectors because then we have uh, real numbers and it makes sense to compute gradients. Uh, but one of the big progress in recent years as well has been to extend these, uh, these uh, systems to non-vector data. Maybe the most uh, impressive applications is natural language processing, where for example, when you take Google Translate, uh, you, write, you type a text in in French and you can output uh, the, the translation in German or English uh, and these go through this, this type of system. Right? So this means that instead of having a vector as input and a number as output, nowadays we have ways to have a string as input and a string as output and the way it works is basically that the strings are mapped to vectors and then there is some computation on vectors and then the resulting vectors are, are mapped back to, to, uh, to strings. Um, this notion has been extended to other things, like this picture describes, taken from a website in Stanford, describes uh, an idea of uh, how you can do machine learning on chemistry, uh, where as input you have a graph that represents a molecule or a protein, and through various operations manages to predict, for example, in that case, if some drugs uh, can, uh, can have side effects. Right, so technically what's interesting here is that, again, the input is not a vector and still, uh, people de design smart ways to transform these, these combinatorial objects, these discrete objects, in the continuous space, uh, and then to train the model using gradient descent, basically to train all parameters, uh, etc. So I think it's, it's kind of a big trend nowadays to say now that we have uh, many of these uh, components that can be trained by gradient descent, and now that we have the hardware, like GPUs, TPUs at Google, etc., uh, can we go beyond that, uh, either to extend machine learning to other types of data, or maybe not to solve machine learning problems, but like learning uh, big systems with tunable parameters to perform some tasks. Uh, and so today we'll talk about a specific type of data and operation, which turns out to be quite present in statistics and machine learning, but for which uh, it's not very clear how you can, uh, you know, compute gradients. Um, and so these data are rankings of permutations. Uh, these are similar words for the same thing. So what I mean by ranking is typically when, uh, you know, we have some data which are, which describe some preferences uh, as a set, as an order list. Uh, for example, if you, if you do wine testing, you may taste five wines and ask someone, can you rank the wines from the one you prefer to the one you, you dislike most? And so the, the, the output of that person would not be a vector, it would be an ordering uh, of the five bottles of wines. So it's clear that these data are very common, either potentially as inputs to machine learning systems, like if you collect such data, maybe you want to predict something out of this data, or as outputs, because sometimes you want to predict preferences, example being for example, uh, search engines where given some 
uh, uh, query and, and things we know about person, we want to output some ranked list of, uh, of items or web pages that the person may be interested in. Right? So in this case, what we want to predict is some fragmentation. Uh, so it's clear that we would like machine learning systems to be able to manipulate permutations. Uh, but there's also, I think, something even more important that, uh, that we did not really start doing yet, but that could be important in the future, is that internally to these big systems, I said that I said earlier that we have we have layers like conversional layers or uh, linear layers. Maybe there are some layers where we would like to go through ranking operations. And, and just uh, to give a practical example uh, that I will develop later, uh, suppose you want to have a layer that performs some some kind of smart normalization called quantile normalization. Um, maybe that's something not all of you are familiar with, but if you take the images on the bottom of my screen, you have two pictures, one on the left, which is a bit hard to, to see, and one on the right with uh, more contrast, where you see three, uh, three people on the sea. Basically, the two images represent the same scene, so maybe you would like your system to be able to play with both of them and recognize the same thing. The only difference is that uh, the, the level of, of color, so these are black and white pictures, uh, the histogram of colors used in the two pictures are different. Uh, actually, the, the, the picture on the right is, is something you can get if you manipulate your old pictures with Photoshop. Uh, it's called a histogram equalized uh, image where you took the original image on the left and uh, which you see does not have a big, uh, big contrast be between the dark and, and, and light uh, positions. And to go to the right, you just change the histograms of colors used on the on, or intensities used on the image to be uh, more uniform from dark, uh, from black to white. Okay, so so how does that relate to, you know, the bottles of wines? Uh, well, it relates because between the left and the right image, the only information that has been kept is the ranking of the pixels in terms of intensity meaning that to go from the bad quality left picture to the good quality uh, right picture, the, mathematically the operation that has been done is to rank all the pixels from the darkest to the lightest, and then reassign intensity, so black, black and white value, to each pixel using some uniform distribution, but keeping the ordering. So you may argue that in fact, even in these examples, the, the important signal in the image is not really the values of the intensities, if you consider it as a vector, for example, but more importantly, the relative order of the pixels. And so this means that maybe the important thing here uh, that you, you would like to, to manipulate in the machine learning system is a big permutation that tells you the relative ordering of all pixels. And second thing that it tells you is that maybe in some uh, layers of a, of a deep learning system, you may want to have some layers that given some input signal that will look like the one on the left, would transform it like the one on the right. Uh, this is, for example, you may have heard of something called batch normalization in deep learning. That's super, that, you know, that's, some people would call that a magical trick. Uh, that's a way when, when you have some computation at some layer to renormalize the data so that they are better scaled and it turns out to really improve the behavior of many machine learning systems. So maybe you, you may want to say, well, batch normalization is nice, but we can do even better at some layer to do some quantile normalization. The difficulty is that for quantile normalization, you need to sort the pixels, reassign them values, and this is typically non-differentiable, so we cannot do it right now. But if we could, then we could add some intermediate layers, uh, fully differentiable layers somewhere in our systems to give us more, uh, uh, you know, more possibilities to perform basic tasks. All right, so uh, so based on these motivations, what, what is it that we would like to do? Well, uh, we would like to play with what I mentioned already, what I already called permutations. So permutations uh, mathematically is just a mapping from n items to themselves. Uh, if we call that sigma, then think of sigma of i as the rank of item i. So if you have sigma of one would be a number between one and n that tells you the item one is ranked number sigma of i, etc. And mathematically, it's very well known that the set of all possible permutations uh, is a big set. There are factorial n permutations of n items. And they form what's called a group in algebra, meaning you can compose them if you have two permutations. 
there is a neutral element if you compose with the identity, etc. Right. So this is a completely well understood system in, in mathematics. And the question is, how do we do machine learning uh, with this type of data? So what I will focus on now more technically is, is two aspects, uh, two, let's say two ingredients that we would like to create to be able to manipulate and learn with permutations. The first one in red on this slide uh, is what I call embedding. Uh, and so embed is just, if we want to manipulate um, permutations using computational layers of deep learning, for example, then we need to be able to represent a permutation as a vector in some space, because then we can compute, you know, uh, manipulate vectors using in our algebra, uh, using uh, any transformation layer, etc. So the first question is, how do we embed the, the symmetric group, SM, so the set of all permutations, into a vector space of some dimension? And this, this will be useful for at least two things. One is if we have as input permutations, like if as input you collect preferences, this would allow you to learn from, uh, from permutations. Uh, it may also be useful in outputs. For example, if you want to predict some permutation, like to predict the preferences of someone, then maybe you want to embed the true label as a vector and define loss functions like the square distance in some, in some uh, output space. Right, so just, just embedding the symmetric group to RP is a useful operation uh, to learn from and to learn uh, to rankings. The second thing I would consider is a bit more ambitious. It's what I mentioned earlier as intermediate layers. Suppose you want in your system to be able to have some layers where you have some permutations. So for example, and I would just focus on that, suppose that you have some vector at some point, this could be the input image, but this could be anywhere in your computational graph, uh, you know, a vector that is computed. And at some point, you, you have a way to transform this vector into a permutation. Think of the arc sort operation or the rank operation. This is a way, given a vector, to say, you know, to, to sort the entries from the largest to the smallest. And then, from, and then you would like this permutation to be useful for something. For example, when you do the image uh, uh, normalization I mentioned, you start from a bad quality image, you rank the pixels, and then you reassign them some values to get a new image. Then going from the left image to the right image is a uh, discontinuous operation because of the arc sort. But if we were able to differentiate it, so to make it differentiable and compute gradient, then we would be able uh, to learn with systems that incorporate such layers. Right? So this would be the second topic, uh, technical topic of my talk today, how to create differentiable ranking operation in the sense of going from some vector to an output vector that represents a permutation in a continuous and differentiable way. All right, so I will uh, successively talk of these two aspects, uh, embedding and differentiating before talking of various extensions. Uh, I must say that I'm just gonna you know, discuss things uh, I've been working on with my colleagues and students, so there are probably many other ways to type a problem. Uh, my goal is not to give a, a broad, uh, lecture on this topic, but just to describe what we have there. So I'll focus in particular uh, on, on, on two things. Uh, and before going uh, you know, to describing the two uh, embeddings um, uh, I have in mind, let, let me first have a, a you know, general discussion. What, what, what do we want? So I say here we focus on embedding, meaning uh, representing each permutation as a vector. And of course, there are many ways to do that. You could decide arbitrarily uh, different ways to, to represent a permutation as a vector. By the way, maybe the, the simplest one, I already showed it. If you look at this plot, you see that, uh, I mean, if you looked at this plot, this, is, uh, this plot describes the set of all permutations of four items. And you see that here, I represent a permutation as four numbers. So you could say, well, this looks like a representation of a permutation as four numbers and therefore as a vector of four dimension. And you're right, actually this is one possible embedding called the permutahedron, uh, which I will talk a little bit uh, uh, more uh, about later. But for the moment, let's consider broader things like what are the possible embeddings to any dimension? So th again, this is a ill post problem because there are many ways to do that, but if you want to do something useful, maybe we can think in terms of how to capture interesting features of a permutation because we want to do machine learning typically from these things. 
uh, how to create some embeddings that lead to efficient algorithms, because let's not forget that SN is a big space, factorial N objects, so we, we don't want uh, to create things where some you know, gradient or some computations take an exponential number of times in the number of items. Uh, but still, this is lots of freedom. So I will just add one, uh, one thing here, which, uh, you know, which maybe we don't always need to have, but that I think we need to have in many cases, which is the notion of right invariance. So just to explain this thing, let me, um, let me go back to this picture of the permutahedron here. So think of this, uh, this picture here as a visual representation of all permutations of four items, okay? So we could say, well, each, uh, each permutation here in this picture is, is mapped to a point in imagine in three dimension. Um, now, what, what is this right invariance that I, that I mentioned earlier? Uh, you have to think that a permutation typically describes which, you know, which items someone prefers. So for example, here, if you have four items, imagine you have four bottles of wine and you ask someone, which one do you prefer? Which one do you rank second, third and fourth? So the person will give you, would output some, um, some list like four, one, three, two, just to say that he prefers the, the wine number four, then followed by wine number one, followed by wine number three, followed by two. But you would agree with me that uh, the y number four is uh, the number four is a number that you typically the organizer decided beforehand, like to the alphabetic order of the ones of the ones to the, to the you know to define what is y number one, two, three, four. Okay. So imagine now that you know the same person goes goes to some uh, other uh, wine testing with the same wines, but the organizer just took the reverse alphabetic order to define which, which, which one is the wine number one uh, and two and three and four, then the same preference would correspond to some other point in 3D because instead of three, one, uh, four, one, three, two, it may be something else just because the names, the input names of the wines have changed, right? So this seems to be problematic because then it means that the mapping depends on some arbitrary choice of how you initially name the items. Uh, I'm talking of wine, but if you think in terms of pixel in an image, the same thing happens. If you decide to number the pixels from, from the top left to the bottom right, or from, from the top right to the bottom left, then the permutation is different, right, for a given image. So this is unavoidable, because again, there is some arbitrary here, but what you may want to avoid is that if you want to learn uh, with, let's say, with several uh, inputs, several permutations as inputs, you, you don't want your system to learn different things depending on this arbitrary order. So this can be translated by saying that if you have several, you know, suppose you have the, the preferences of three persons corresponding to three permutations on this picture, what you would like is that if someone changes arbitrarily the names of the wines, then the three permutations would be mapped with three other ones, but their relative distances or relative positioning would not change, right? You would like something like a rotation applied to them. So this is a long story just to say that mathematically we may want to impose on um, something which is that if you change arbitrarily the names of the items, which mathematically corresponds to uh, composing on the right by uh, any given permutation pi, then you will add the embedding of any two permutations, if we call them sigma one and sigma two, you would like, I mean, they can change, but you would like, for example, that their relative distances not to change. Right, you would like the geometry not to be impacted by this arbitrary change of initial label. And so if you constrain, if you impose that, then you constrain a lot of the embeddings which are possible. And I don't have time to go to details, but you can show that this is equivalent to imposing that the inner product uh, of any two uh, permutation is just a function of their what's called difference, meaning uh, composition of sigma one by sigma two inputs. All right, so this being said, let, let me now go uh, a bit more concrete and present uh, two embeddings. So two ways to map SN to RP uh, with um, some dimension P. SN is a space of permutation, RP is a vector space. I call them Sukwan and Kendall, I will explain why, but uh, these are names, you know, we decided with uh, my, my students. So uh, Sukwan is the work of Marine Lemovo uh, and uh, Kendall, the work of uh, Yunong Zhao. 
And uh, as you will see, both of them are a bit arbitrary, but they, are inter they have interesting features. And in particular, they turned out to be uh, you know, invariant by, uh, um, by renaming. So let's start with the Suquan embedding, and let me explain to you why I call that Suquan. I'm sure I call that Suquan, but this embedding is something that anybody uh, interested in, in the symmetric group knows about. Uh, the, the official name, I would say, in algebra is called the permutation representation. So it's just a way to say that if you have a permutation sigma, uh, meaning a mapping from integer one to n to themselves, then you can represent this permutation as an n by n matrix, which I plot uh, on this picture. Uh, it's a binary matrix with most phi zeros and a few ones. And you put one exactly at the position i, j, if sigma of j is equal to i. Right? So think of it as the, the columns are the items, the rows are the ranks, and you just indicate a one if some item has some rank in your permutation. So it turns out that this, this mapping uh, is called permutation representation because in, you know, in, the, in algebra, uh, it turns out to be what's called a group representation. For those of you who you know, have some background in algebra, then you may know that the representation is just a mapping such that when you take you know, the matrices corresponding to two permutations, then the product of the matrices is the matrices corresponding to the product of the permutations. This is a detail you don't need to, you know, not very important for the rest. But as a consequence of that is that you can check that it is right invariant in the sense that if you, right, if I come back to the definition of, of invariance, if you compose any two permutation on the right by any new permutation, then they would be mapped to two different matrices, but the distance between the two matrices or their inner product does not change. All right, so this is one possibility, you see, and you transform uh, a sigma permutation sigma into a matrix, and then this matrix can be the input of any further operation like convolution in our uh, inner product, etc. So uh, let me just say a couple of words about this one and why we call that Sukwan. But this one is very uh, related to this uh, notion of quantile normalization that I mentioned on how you, you can modify an image into a better image by keeping the ordering of the pixels and changing their values. Uh, long story short, if you mathematically write how you move from the left image to the right image, as I said, you need first to extract the ranking of the pixels and then to reassign some value to each pixel depending on its rank. And you can show that mathematically, it corresponds to, if you take the, the last uh, equation on this slide, to take the left image x, compute sigma of x, which is the permutation of the pixel. So this, you know, in Python, this is what uh, something like uh, the rank operator would do. So assign to each pixel its rank from one to uh, many. And then compute from sigma this permutation matrix. So it's huge because the number of rows and columns is equal to the number of pixels. And then multiply this matrix or its transpose by F, which would be uh, the vector of values you want uh, in your final image, right? So for example, F, if you want your image to have all colors from white to black, it would be a vector of values uh, from you know, zero to 255. Uh, and, and if you multiply your matrix by F, it's a way to permute uh, the, the entries in F and get the right image. Right, so, so there is a link between this transformation and this matrix by sigma, which is this representation here. So one comment here is that, uh, you know, I, I said that, sorry, I, if I come back here, in this case, uh, we decided to, to get the right image to this to impose that the uh, the histogram of intensities after normalization is uniform between zero and 255 so between uh, full white and full black but you may say maybe there is a better choice of of target uh, target distribution for the values of intensities instead of being uniform like in the middle you may decide that the, the intensities of your pixels should follow some gaussian distribution or by Gaussian or something else. And maybe there is some optimal, uh, you know, some optimal way to transform your data. So that, so when I say optimal, it means that if you transform them with some particular target function, then maybe you can uh, do a better job at your uh, subsequent operations, which could be, for example, image recognition or 
uh, uh, you know, a classification of landscape or this kind of thing. So you may have some, uh, some subsequent operation that depends on the result of this operation. And so uh, an idea is that because it's hard to decide what is the best F, maybe F, uh, so the, the histogram of values here, uh, could be left as a free parameter. And this is what we call suquan. So suquan just means supervised SU uh, quant for quantile normalization. So quantile normalization is the operation that given a target quantile uh, distribution, uh, transforms some data by imposing the, the values of the intensities that you want. And supervised quantile uh, normalization is when you leave the F, so F could be the, the, the histogram after normalization as a free parameter and put it uh, as a free parameter to be optimized, right? So um, in this slide, I, uh, I describe in the top what is learning with standard quantile normalization. So usually you start with some data, you do quantile normalization of your data and you learn a model which typically amounts to minimizing some objective function with uh, the normalization fixed. And what we propose in SUP1 is to, to leave uh, the normalization as a free parameter. And because we're able to write the normalization as some particular matrix pi multiplied by F, this amounts to saying in your equation that you have a free parameter F and a bigger uh, objective function that includes the f as a parameter as well as any other parameter in your system right so i, I do want to say that uh, I, I take the example of of these uh, photographs because it's visual but i'm not sure it's very used in, in image processing or computer vision but for those of you working on genomics for example quantile normalization is one of the very very often used uh, data processing strategies when you have genomic data because typically um, in genomics, you measure lots of values, a bit like lots of pixels, and the values you measure, let's say if you do gene expression or epigenomics, uh, are typically very dependent on the experimental conditions, could be temperature, could be humidity in the air, could be quality of your, um, of your system. And so uh, in many cases, the first thing you do when you get the data from the machine is to, to, to do some, some kind of normalization. And quantile normalization is one, uh, is one normalization heavily used in genomics. So what I say is that you know, instead of first doing quantile normalization and then using your data, maybe you can just extract the permutation from your machine and learn the normalization uh, using this system. All right. Uh, so I, I do have some experiments, but nothing very uh, uh, very strong here. So uh, for sake of time, I will I will go a bit faster now. Uh, but just to tell you that, uh, for example, again visual, visually, if you have some images and you train this system, what I say is that you learn jointly to transform your data and to do some tasks like in this case, discriminate between images of horses and airplanes. Uh, and as a byproduct, if you impose, for example, that your uh, transformation is piecewise constant, it's a way also to discretize your data. So on the right column here, you see something that has been learned fully automatically just to discriminate horses and airplanes. And it has learned as well that to change the values of the pixel, you need, uh, you know, you need to, um, uh, to discretize them into four levels. So it learns automatically the levels uh, where you cut. So this, this may have applications as well in data compression, for example, where you jointly learn the quantization of your images uh, so that you maximize some uh, the quality of a task uh, based on this representation. Okay, so this was the Suquan embedding. Now the Suquan embedding is nice, but it has limitations like, uh, you know, when you make a linear model on this, you just capture information like some item is ranked at some position. So let me talk quickly of a second one, uh, which is, uh, a, what, what we call the Kendall embedding, I will, I will explain to you why, which is just a second possible embedding of sigma into a vector matrix. So it's visually shown here, you see that the embedding is a bit the same, the output is a n by n matrix, but the recipe is a bit different. Uh, here we still have a binary matrix, but the ij's value for permutation sigma is one if and only if the rank of item i is smaller than the rank of item j. Right, so uh, it's a bit different from the previous one. But if you think of it, you, you may see that you can deduce that one from the previous one in a quite simple way, but it's a different one. 
So uh, why would you use that? Uh, just a few comments about this. So imagine that this can create a geometry, right? It means that uh, you map the symmetric group as uh, in a vector space of dimension n square here, n times n. So you can think a bit, uh, what, what's the geometry you've created? For example, if you map different permutations, how far are they from each other? Uh, if you learn a model in that space, um, you know, what's the geometry impulse? So some interesting comments to see here is that, for example, if I, if I go to the second part of the slide, distance, uh, it's easy to see that if you have two permutations, sigma and sigma prime, and you map them to these matrices, and you compute the distance, so you know, these are vectors in n square dimensional uh, space, then their square equivalent distance is equal to up to a constant two, nd, which is the number of discordant pairs between sigma and sigma prime. And so for statisticians in the room, this is something quite familiar uh, when, when, you know, it may remind you of what's called Spearman's, uh, uh, sorry, not Spearman, but Kendall's stall correlation. Uh, Kendall's stall correlation between two vectors is, is defined up to normalization to the number of concordant pairs, which in our case is the inner product between two matrices. And the number of discordant pairs is related to one minus the Kendall's stall. So in other way, the geometry created by this embedding corresponds to a measure, uh, well-known measure of distance between permutations, uh, which, which allows to, to compare two permutations by how much they differ in terms of how many pairs are in the same order in the two permutations. Now, an interesting byproduct of that is, uh, you know, if you've ever used Kendall Stow, then you may know that it's possible to compute the Kendall Stow uh, in n log n operation because it amounts to do a sorting. And so here I just said that Kendall Stow is, is a distance or equivalently, uh, you know, it's related to a distance or an inner product. So this shows that in this n square dimensional space, we can compute distances and inner product in n log n operations, thanks to a sort operation. So there is some factorization here. Uh, and therefore, you know, if, if you decide not to, I mean, if you decide to use this embedding to learn some models uh, with large n but not so many permutations, you may go to the dual, use what's called the kernel, uh, kernel methods, and have fast implementations of your model. All right, so this is what we did in some applications in, in genomics, again, uh, gene expression data classification. Uh, and we observed that in this data, uh, just, uh, you know, just looking at gene expression, forgetting about the values, but keeping the relative order of the genes, uh, turns out to be as efficient uh, in terms of predicting phenotype, like uh, discriminating between cancer and non-cancer. Uh, if, if you just forget about the values which are measured, but just look at the relative ordering of the genes using the Kendall uh, talk All right. So I think I would, uh, for the sake of time, I will skip a couple of, of details here and jump to the next sec next uh, thing I want to discuss, which is differentiating. And this is a bit newer, newer so this is more recent work, uh, which again, um, wants to tackle a different problem. So not only do we want to represent the permutation as a vector, but now more ambitiously, we want to be able to go from a vector to a permutation, for example, using arc sort or rank, uh, and then to a vector again. So the second part, the embedding is what I discussed already. Now I'd like to discuss the composition of two and, and hopefully try to make it differentiable, right? So that we can have a layer, for example, that takes as input a vector, does this quantile normalization and be able to train a model where there is a quantile normalization step somewhere in, in the network. Now, what, what's the problem here? Uh, one problem is that going from the vector to, to the discrete space Sn, uh, using, for example, arc sort, so you, you have a vector, you sort the entries, and you look uh, at the, who is the largest, who is the second largest, et cetera. Uh, it's clear that this operation is piecewise constant, meaning that you have many vectors with the same, uh, the same arc sort, and, and it jumps suddenly, uh, so it's not differentiable everywhere, and where it is differentiable, the, the, the derivative is equal to zero, right? So ba basically, you cannot uh, backpropagate any signal from, from a permutation uh, to the initial vector by arc sort, right? So it's not just a question of how can you compute the, the gradient, it's more than the gradient is uninformative. 
right? Again, the gradient of the arc sort is almost everywhere equal to zero uh, and is not defined everywhere. So the question is, how can we change a bit this arc sort maybe so that uh, when you combine arc sort and embedding, you manage to have a differentiable operation? And so we worked on that with colleagues, uh, in particular Marco Pituri uh, and Olivier Tebou. Uh, and, and something that we, we, we did, so I will just you know, give you a recipe and then um, give a broader picture, is to, to relate that to a field called optimal transport, which is an odd field in mathematics that, that deals with the problem of how can you move from one distribution, like on this picture, you have a distribution mu nuts, uh, you want to move it to mu one, and you ask the question, how can I move uh, from, from the red to the blue distributions by minimizing the total cost of moving? So you have a function t that is the, the cost of moving any, you know, any object from the first distribution to the, uh, any object of the second distribution. Uh, mathematically, the same thing can be expressed as follows. Uh, you define a cost matrix. So here we assume that mu naught is made of n items. Mu1 is made of n items and you want to move the n items for their, from their initial position to their target positions. And you have a matrix C of cost that tells you how much it costs to move any item from one position to any other uh, position. And so the goal of optimal transport is just uh, to say who you should move who to minimize the total cost. Mathematically, this can be expressed as a linear program where you, P would be what you're looking for. So it's the transportation plan telling you who should move where. Uh, and you want to minimize the total cost, which is uh, just the inner product between P and C, where P would be uh, uh, the, you know, the sequence embedding. So it would be a binary matrix that tells you which item is moved to which uh, other item. Um, and so P is a matrix, but uh, you can relax uh, as well this uh, linear program uh, to the uh, convex hull of the, um, of the permutation matrices, which is called the Birkhoff polyphone. Yeah. Right, so this is the standard definition of optimal transport. Now it turns out that uh, optimal transport usually is hard to solve, but in 1D, like on this picture, it's super easy to solve because you can show, we can show, and it's, it's written here, I skip the details, but you can show that the solution when you move a one-dimensional measure to some other one-dimensional measure, the optimal cost, if the cost is, is normal, like, uh, like expressed in this lemma, uh, the optimal cost is simply to move from right to left to right to left, meaning you move the leftmost item in mu naught to the leftmost item in mu one, the second most item in mu naught to the second most item in mu one, etc. All right, this is the solution. If, for example, the cost is a square distance uh, between the, the initial and the target position. All right, so usually in optimal transport, uh, this is used to to efficiently solve optimal transport in one D. It's not true anymore in 2, 2D or, um, or higher dimension, but in one dimensional, this is how it works. Now for us, what's interesting is that we are able to express, you know, instead of solving optimal transport with sorting, now what we do is that we express pi sigma, so the, the, the sequence embedding of, of the arc sort of x as a solution of some linear program. And in order to make it differentiable, we add something that's called um, entropy regularization, where we say instead of minimizing the exact cost, we minimize the cost penalized by the negative entropy of the plan. Right? So P would be the, the matrix that tells you which item moves where. And if you penalize the negative entropy, you would prevent it from converging to the exact uh, permutation matrix and instead to be, instead of being binary, to be. Uh, non-binary and, and, and be a smooth function of, of X. Because, uh, so the idea of entropic organization was proposed by Marco Pituri a few years ago, and so we extended it here uh, to, um, to the ranking problem. And so long story short, uh, first, this thing can be computed super efficiently thanks to some algorithm called Synchron, which is just written here. So it's just five lines in, five lines in Python to compute that. Second, it can be differentiated so either by synchron or you can be a bit more fancy. Uh, and it can be, and it's fast because the complexity is, uh, so in this case is quadratic in N, right? So this is a way, uh, if I repeat, instead of having P of, P of X to be the permutation matrix of X, to be a smooth permutation matrix, 
derived from this optimal transport and which is differentiable as a function of x. Right, so uh, if I sk skipping a result, this is the kind of things that we get. So if the epsilon of x for epsilon is a smooth version of x, then we end up with a differentiable matrix P that can be used, for example, to compute some sorted vector. You're interested to multiply your, your matrix by x on the right. Or the vector of rank. Uh, remember, the vector of rank is just a, a vector with values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, n in some, some position. And if you look, for example, at the central image on this slide, uh, this, is the vector, this is the vector of ranks as a function of epsilon, which is the regularization strength, how much you penalize the negative entropy. So on the left, you don't penalize it. So you see that the values of the rank are integer values between 0 and 9 in this case. So 9 would correspond to uh, the, the coordinate of your input vector with the largest entry, 8 to the second one, etc. And you see that when you increase epsilon, so when you regularize, you start having ranks which are non-integer anymore. So they actually they converge to some constant value if you regularize too much. And the interesting thing is that this vector of ranks is a differentiable function of x and you can compute efficiently the gradients. So this means now that you can you can include in your computational graph some uh, sort, arc sort, ranking operations and get differentiability with respect to x. Um, so we did some you know toy uh, simulations to check and, and the kind of things that we, we can solve these are problems where, for example, you learn to run, so in this case, uh, given some input image, uh, predict, uh, you know, predict the values of the images uh, and, and the relative runs. And so we showed, for example, that we, we get uh, distant results in some toy, uh, toy, toy examples. All right, so uh, I see that time is uh, running short in time. So we'll just uh, say one word about different extensions and then conclude. So, uh, and, and if you have questions, I, I could go deeper in the extensions. So, first, uh, first comment, uh, here I just talked about, um, about uh, ranking and sorting, but in fact, uh, and we did that uh, uh, on other previous paper, it's possible to extend the notion of ranking to quantize. For example, if you want to have a differentiable median or a differentiable quantile, and this is what very well adapted to this uh, optimal transport setting, just by saying that you don't want to map endpoints to endpoints, but you want to map your n input points to m, where m is smaller than n things. And this allows, for example, to define soft top k losses, where you don't care about the full ranking of your predictions, but just on the top k rankings, and you can capture very easily in a differentiable way the kth value in a vector. Uh, second comment is that we, we did, and, and this will be, uh, uh, this will present that as ICML uh, soon. Uh, we, we, you know, we worked on something that I think could, could have lots of uh, impact in different fields like uh, uh, genomics in particular, where uh, there is a, where we focus on matrix factorization. So suppose X is a big matrix of data, then it's common to try to factorize it to extract low dimensional uh, factors that explain the data. But usually we do that up to normalization. Like typically when you get the raw data, you log transform them or you do TFIDF kind of normalization so that the matrix looks low rank. And so what we propose is uh, a bit like in the SUC one to learn uh, jointly the, the normalization and the low rank um, factors uh, so that you don't have to impose yourself to do TFIDF or log normalization, but learn how to do that. And this is possible because now uh, we have an operator that does these normalization, which is differentiable with respect to the outputs of the models, as well as with respect to the inputs. Uh, third comment is that I, I presented the optimal transport a bit like a magic bullet, where it seems to be very lucky that we could start from optimal transport, have uh, extract the rank, and then do entropy regularization. Uh, but in fact, there's a bigger picture uh, where uh, that, that I think allows to do uh, to differentiate many things. So uh, the recipe, in a sense, is to express what we want. So the, what we want is we bring from the input to the output uh, the function phi of arc sort. What we did with optimal transport, in fact, is just writing this in what's called the variational way. So we express the solution as the uh, the, the minimal, uh, so the solution of, of the minimization problem in the output space, and then we regularize this thing to get a differentiable function. 
And this can be extended to a variety of things as soon as you define an embedding and as soon as you define a variational formulation and a regularization. And just to give you some idea of um, you know, what other people have done, so this is a recent work that will be presented at ICML as well of my colleagues uh, Mathieu Blondel, uh, and others. Uh, where they did the same, you know, the same ID, but instead of embedding in the sequen, so instead of taking the sequen embedding, they embed it to the permutahedron, which is a bit smaller. Uh, then in the permutahedron, you can again express the arc sort as some optimization problem. And if you regularize by negative entropy or equivalent norm, then you can uh, obtain very fast, in this case, n log n algorithm to compute a smooth version of the range as well as the smooth grade. All this is available as uh, publicly available uh, as on, on some GitHub accounts. All right, and, and finally, uh, let me finish uh, on, on the last uh, thing, which, uh, which is very recent work. So we just submitted a tech report uh, on that with Quentin Berthe and others, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is a link between regularization and perturbation. Uh, again, it would be a bit long to go to details, but uh, for those of you who've heard of the Gumball trick, uh, which is something quite popular in machine learning recently, uh, which is a way to re-express the softmax uh, as the expectation of a max with perturbation. In fact, there is a, a clear link between perturbing data and regularizing. And no surprise, what, what I just presented can be uh, done as well through perturbation. So what I said is that if you have the rank, you can express it in a rational way and then regularize. But another way to do is to express it as in a rational way and then perturb it and take the expectation of your perturbed uh, arc sort. And it's possible to show that the resulting value is a, you know, is a smooth function of the input and its gradient can be computed efficiently. Okay, so I think I, I, will, uh, I will just keep the, the last one uh, because it's a bit different and go to the conclusion. I'm sorry, I was a bit long and I started late, so I think it's time to stop. Uh, but in short, I, uh, you know, the main motivation of this talk was to, to show how machine learning nowadays goes well beyond you know, learning on vectors. First, now we want to learn on other things like strings, graphs, and now permutations. And more generally, uh, we are looking after big differentiable systems that allow to have various operations. And so ranking, but as well as other things like shortest path, uh, are operations which are not differentiable, but nowadays we provide tool, to, tools to make them differentiable. So I talked about uh, different embeddings of the symmetry group. Uh, I talked about how we can create this differentiable version through regularization and very quickly at the end through perturbation and how this can be generated to other things. I'd like to finish by thanking you know, uh, many people on this picture and beyond. I'm sorry, uh, many people are not here, but in particular for this particular talk, uh, Marco Couturi, Mathieu Blondel, uh, Quentin Berthe, Olivier Tebou, uh, who work with me at, at Google, as well as Francis Back, Marine Lemovon, uh, Yunong Zhao, and John Sweet, with whom we worked on these, uh, uh, on these matrix factorization and stuff. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to stay a bit longer for questions. Hey, thank you very much, Jean Philippe, for the talk. It was very, very clear and uh, very interesting. I don't see any question on the Q&A. So for all the attendees, if you have any question, you can ask them. Otherwise, maybe it was so clear that no one has any question. Okay, I start by one. I have, I have some about like when you talk about like uh, the equivalence between the smooth regularization and smooth perturbation. Yeah. So when should you when should you use one and when should you use the other i mean from a computational point of view is there like some i don't know some insight yeah that's a very good good question i, I don't have a, a simple and general answer so what i know is that uh, i have examples where one or the other are more efficient computationally uh, on the other hand they also compute different things so typically the perturbation one allows you to compute a stochastic gradient mm -hmm. because you know, it's the expectation of something. So to compute a gradient of this thing, you would typically uh, generate a random perturbation and this random perturbation, so it would give you a, a, an expected value and an expected gradient, right? So sometimes, uh, so sometimes this can be very fast, like the, you know, the, 
the Gumball trick is for the soft max, the max operation is super fast. Uh, in the case of what uh, I presented on the permutahedron, uh, oh, sorry, this one was regularized. Uh, we have some other, other, other case in mind using the candle. So we did some experiment on the candle embedding where it's possible as well to have a very fast max in N log N. But then you pay your price because it's just a stochastic gradient. So you, you have some variance. And so typically you would need to repeat that several times in order to get less variance in the gradient. And so I don't have a you know, general recipe, but I know that in some cases it, it can be computationally advantageous to have a, stochast a fast stochastic gradient uh, using perturbation, uh, as opposed to having a non-stochastic gradient uh, with regularization. But it seems to be very, so maybe you know more than me on that, by the way, but uh, it seems to be very specific on which, you know, on which uh, polytop you project and, and, and which uh, tricks you can use. Okay, so like, like the trade-off is the same for deterministic or stochastic optimization kind of. Sometimes it would be easier so, yeah. to, to use a stochastic yeah. method. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much. For the attendees, are there like uh, no other questions for Jean-Philippe? No. no, okay, so I think it's okay. So, yeah, so thank you again, Jean Philippe. For, uh, thank you. Me. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, please allow me to say some words of closing. Uh, thank you for your presentation this afternoon, Jean Philippe. I would like also to thank all of you in the audience for attending this event. Regarding the next seminar, this year's colloquium series is taking a break over summer and will be back on September 14th featuring a talk of Professor Nakbal of Harvard University. If you're interested to learn more about the center, please follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can find us uh, on the website or in the chat. Uh, you can find our Twitter handle. I wish you all a great day and thank you. We're looking forward to welcoming you in September again. Goodbye. <laughs>